Professor Wilson on the heart. Here we are dissecting a sheep heart today. We may actually take a look at a cow heart too. This is what we call a pluck. It's got some of the other parts attached. This is a lung. We're not going to look at that in great detail. We want to take a look at the heart. So um, this is the anterior view of the pig heart. Um, it's kind of tricky finding the blood vessels and how they come in and out of the heart. And once we're in the heart, uh, figuring out which ones are which. So I'm gonna, I've, I've already sliced the heart um, in a, a longitudinal or coronal section. We're gonna take a look. You can tell the left ventricle from the right ventricle because the left will have a much, much thicker muscular wall in it. Okay, so I'm gonna put this aside for a moment. We'll take a look briefly at a couple of the special structures in here. The valves of the heart, which are pretty important, are basically just flaps. They're passive. They don't have any active motion of their own. They co are completely dependent on the flow of fluid through and the change in pressure as the uh, ventricles and the atria contract in the heart. So the lower set of valves, which allow as blood comes into the top of the heart through the atria, we'll take a look at those externally in a minute. As the blood comes in through the atria, it drops down into the ventricles in the lower part, which is where the power comes from for pumping to the lungs and pumping to the rest of the body. And what happens is for the blood to flow down, there are these little flaps right here. Okay? And these flaps uh, are connected by tiny little tendons called cordy tendony. You can see them right here. Let me get a, an instrument for that. So these are cordy tendony. And those are attached to some special muscles. Let's see if I can get some of those exposed for you. Maybe we'll look on this other part of the heart. Here we have some. The cordy tendon here attached to some special muscles right here called papillary muscles. And a papilla literally translates to nipple, but they look a little bit like, um, like fingers, kind of. They're little muscular structures that come up. And when the, when the, the blood flows passively down into the lower ventricle, but when the ventricle pumps real hard, it pushes those flaps closed, kind of like the swinging doors in a restaurant or something, and then they stop um, because these cordy tendony hang on to them. If the cordy tendony are weak or stretched out, the pressure of that heart pumping can push them up the other way and prolapse the valve, make those flaps go the wrong direction. We call those flaps cusps, and so when we look at the right and left sides of the heart, we see that the left side, now remember as you're looking at it, it looks like the right, but it's the left side of this, this animal or whoever the patient was, has two, only two flaps on that valve. This valve is called the atrioventricular valve or a cuspid valve, and this one has two flaps, so we call it the bicuspid. This one over here, this has a little coagulated blood in it, and I don't know how well you can see them, but you actually can see all three flaps on this other side, there are three flaps. So on the right side of the heart, the right side of the animal, it's a tricuspid valve. Another name for this bicuspid valve over here is uh, the mitral valve, and it's called that because the funny hat that a bishop or the pope wears on their formal occasions um, is, has two kind of white colored pointy structures that come together in the middle, and they make that big white pointy hat. So that's called a mitre, a bishop's mitre. And somebody thought that these two flaps coming together look like that bishop's hat, and so they call it the mitral valve as well. Um, so these are the things that sometimes have to be replaced when they wear out or they stretch or something like that. So um, the way that the blood flows into the heart, I'm going to kind of put it back together a little bit here. The blood flows in through the top of the heart. Okay. And it'll flow in both the right side, the right atrium, and the left side, the left atrium, simultaneously. Comes into the right side from the superior vena cava, and also some drainage or some pumping from below from the venous system through the inferior vena cava. And that's where I have this probe right here is, um, not that one, sorry. This one right here. Goes, here's the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava, and they dump into the atrium. And on the surface of the atrium is a funny little structure that looks a little bit like an ear, especially the ear of a wrestler who might have sort of a cauliflower ear. 
We call this the auricle. It's a part of the atrium, and it's ear-looking or ear-shaped, and so that's why it's called the auricle, because auricle refers to the outer part of the ear, and the upper part of the body, you call that an auricle, too. Okay, and it's a, just kind of a ear-shaped pocket or flap on there. Um, on the left side of the heart, coming into the top, the blood comes is return flow from the pulmonary system, from this lung over here, and it comes through pulmonary uh, veins that come into the uh, top of the left atrium. It's one of the few times when veins are highly carry highly oxygenated blood. Um, the other time would be in fetal circulation. Usually veins carry deoxygenated blood, but not always. So that's why you always have to remember that arteries carry blood away from hearts, and veins carry blood towards hearts. Whether they're blue or red in the pictures is not necessarily always the clue. So arteries away. Um, another thing that you can notice if we cut open our, well, let's do it on this one. If we cut open with a scalpel some of our ventricle a little bit, we're going to cut away some of this left ventricle. You can also see some interesting structures on the inside here where it looks, I don't know how to describe it, sort of meaty. This is called trabeculae carni. It's uh, a trabecula is a, a strut. We see trabecular bone in the epiphyses or the um, heads of bones, the uh, the ends of long bones where the red marrow is, and it means that we have these little strut-like muscular structures to give um, uh, to reinforce the strength of the muscle in the heart. There, carni means meat or flesh. So there are muscular struts or fleshy struts that are in there. And then here's some more of these papillary muscles right here. Okay, so once the blood flows down through the atrioventricular valves, the right or tricuspid and the left, the bicuspid, it comes down into that lower part about the same time. When that gets partially filled, the electrical signal, if it's working right, the internal pacemaker of the heart will cause the ventricles to contract and force that blood up out of the heart through arteries because it's going to carry blood away. The left ventricle will come up through where this probe is right here. It'll go right out the aorta, which is this very large blood vessel that comes out the top, and it makes an arch, sometimes called the aortic arch, over the top, and descends down to the descending aorta into the abdominal aorta. And off of that will come um, numerous arteries that will go up to the head. The, um, the carotid will branch off of that. The, uh, the right side of the heart, the blood will be pumped through, a blood vessel known as the pulmonary trunk, which will right away split into a right and left pulmonary arteries, which will carry blood into the lungs to get oxygenated. And then the lungs will return that blood through the pulmonary veins to that left side. Um, that refreshed blood, that blood's got lots of oxygen in it. The blood coming out of this right, excuse me, the left ventricle is going to be the most oxygenated blood. And so right at the top, I don't know if we can see it in this heart, but right at the top of the aorta, there'll be two little openings that will take the freshest, most oxygenated blood right into a special set of circulation that wraps around the top of the heart called the coronary circulation, okay, coronary arteries. And they're a little bit obscured under a lot of fat on most hearts, but there'll be blood vessels that go all the way around here. Why are they called coronary? Well, we learned earlier in the semester that a corona is a crown. Okay, and if we were to peel off this fat, we would see that the blood vessels wrap around and then come down with branches like this, which, if I kind of turn that around, would look like a crown. So it's the crowning circulation around the top of the heart. And it is how the heart gets its blood. It's the busiest, hardest working, longest working muscle you have in your body. So it has to have a fresh supply of blood at all times. Let me show you uh, a little view, um, some diagrams of what happens, here's a healthy coronary circulation, okay, here's a, uh, an angiogram showing the circulation through of healthy coronary blood vessels going around the top of the heart and then coming down into those muscles. And what happens when somebody gets a blockage, when they get um, some arteriosclerosis or some atherosclerosis, either a hardening of the arteries or a plaque buildup in those arteries, is it cuts off the circulation. And what we see in this picture is 
the very, very limited flow and the much less oxygenated blood. You're basically only seeing veins here and very little arterial flow. And look at all this part of the heart is getting no blood supply. This is dying. This person's um, about to have or has already had a, a myocardial infarction where they've killed muscle tissue because it's not getting enough um, blood. The most amazing thing about the heart is it can be have almost 95% uh, blockage of some of these blood vessels and still keep pumping every day. It's really quite miraculous. And then people can even get repairs and bypasses and be able to function after that. Um, the other thing I want to show you about these other valves, as the blood leaves the heart and goes through these big valve up here, this, this aorta, or as it leaves through here, through the uh, right ventricle, through the pulmonary, I can stick my finger through there and come out the, you can see it over here, pulmonary artery, or pulmonary trunk. Um, but at the top of the aorta, it has a semi-lunar valve, half moon. And the way it works is it has three little pouches, they're like cups, and the blood flows up under the cups, and then as soon as the heart relaxes a little and the pressure drops, the fluid starts to flow backward into the heart. Those little cups fill up with blood like balloons, and it blocks the opening. So the blood can't go back into the heart. The blood can only sit right there until the next pump pushes it farther into the circulation. So I don't know if you can see these very well, but... This is one of those little cusps of a semilunar valve. There are three, usually. And so here's a picture looking from the top. Um, you can see some of these cusps on the semilunar valves right here. So here's our two cusps of the, by the mitral valve on the left, three cusps on the uh, right atrioventricular valve, and then here are our two uh, sets of valves leading out of the heart, the aortic semilunar valve, or left semilunar, and the pulmonary semilunar valve, or right semilunar. So you can see how those look. I imagine that blood was flowing backwards and filling up those cups, and then they, they close up. And actually, there is a photograph. Let's see if I can get this on here. We have another little photograph where you can really see those cusps so neatly right here. Here they're open as the blood comes up through, and here would, they would fill up with, in this case they've blown air in there to puff them out so that you can see what they look like. All right, I think that about covers most of our, um, our pig, our uh, sheep heart, excuse me, sheep heart. Uh, pig heart would be about twice this size, and just to give you a little example, of some variations. Here we've got a cow heart, much, much bigger. Okay, one of the nice things about this cow heart that we were looking at is you can see the lovely outer covering of the cavity that the heart sits in. The pericardial cavity has a tough, dense, regular connective tissue lining called the pericardium. Okay, you can also see around the heart that there are big fat deposits. That's to provide energy for the heart. Um, and you can kind of see if I pop this back into its little covering, you can see that nice little pocket that the pericardium makes around. And then there's fluid in here, a serous fluid that's produced by the lining inside here to bathe that heart and to provide um, lubricant because the heart's pumping all the time. You don't want any friction. You know how it is when you rub things together. So there's fluid that's produced in here. And uh, again, just to remind people, the difference between serous fluid and mucus is very, pretty similar, but mucus you only find in membranes that are exposed to the outside world, and serous fluid you only find in membranes that are not exposed to the outside world. So ideally, this should never be exposed to the outside world in its, in its normal function. And if we pop the cow heart open, we can see... Um, Again, you can tell, left ventricle, there's so much muscle, there's almost no uh, chamber in there, okay? Great big vessels. Here are some really cool cordy tendon -y, some nice papillary muscles. Um, you can see your semilunar valves here. And I would just like to show you this beautiful aortic arch that we didn't have such a nice arch on our 
sheep heart, but look how pretty this comes up and goes arches over. Here's a really cool, you can really see the oracle on the atrium of the heart. On the cow heart, it shows up really nicely. So I think that's most of the stuff you guys need to know. So study those diagrams. Take good care of your valves. And exercise adequately so you have a nice, strong heart muscle. Until we meet again.